Hi, this is Miss Slitton, and this is my wonderful seventh period of honors biologist. Say hi. Hi. And what do we have tomorrow? Yes. You know, That's right. That okay. So there's going to be a group part, and there's going to be an individual, individual part. part. So make sure. If I was going to just do some general make sures, okay. Hi. Hi, Pen. Make sure, okay, that you know your additional objectives, okay? They will be on the test. I usually will pull from a couple of different chapters. This is something you wanna be very, very careful of. This would be my warning, okay? Let's say these lovely ladies here are a testing team tomorrow. And let's say they decide you'll do chapter 32's additional objectives, you'll do 33, you'll do 34, and you'll focus on the lab. Are you listening? Yes. If you divvy up your responsibility, you are then giving somebody else the responsibility of your academic learning. What happens if they don't review it the same way you would review it? You might get those questions what? Wrong. Wrong. I would be very cautious to do any divvying. You could say, we're going to learn them all, but I'll be a specialist on this, you be a specialist on that. I would probably have double coverage on specialists. Okay? Just be careful. I have seen that so many times where people have given up the responsibility for the learning to somebody else in their team. That one member doesn't know the answer to that question and everybody gets frustrated at them. Okay, so that'd be my first thing. Make sure you know how to do that. My second thing I would strongly suggest is be comfortable with all the cycles as if I would ask you to diagram them. Oh. <laughs> okay, I would say no die cycles. Be able to diagram those cycles and all the important parts and be able to identify man's impact on those cycles. Generally speaking, how does man? Negative. Negative, yeah. So figure out man's role in each of those. I'd strongly suggest that. Okay, the third thing I would strongly suggest is know how to do a chi-square to analyze data. Do you want to do a practice chi-square? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's do a quick one. Okay, I'm, cons I'm comparing, did I spell cheetah right? Yeah. yeah. Cheetah speeds, okay? Cheetah speeds, let's say um, male cheetahs um, male cheetahs run um, 60 miles per hour, okay? And that's, that's the fastest. Let's say they run 60 miles an hour. Let's say females run um, 55 miles per hour. Okay. Males are usually larger and stronger with a larger lung capacity. Why? Because they're the ones who are, yeah, actually in cheetahs, and they might be fighting. And let's say children, uh, ch their children run uh, 40 miles per hour. Okay? So we're going to compare this. We're going to make this our standard, 60 miles per hour. Do they run statistically differently? If I was going to do a null hypo hypothesis, I would say, what, there is no significant, significant differences in their speed, right? So if that's what I'm going with, remember it's observed minus expected. Take that value, right, and this value right here, and I square it over expected, and I add those up. Okay? So my observed for females is what? 55. And males, what I would expect to be what? 60. 60. And then for children, I observe 40. 40, 40, is that what I said? And expected is what? 60. 60. So what's 55 minus 60? 60. Negative 5. But when you yeah, square negative square 5 squared 20. over what? What I expected. What did I expect? 60. 60. So that's 25 divided by 60. 60. Do you agree with me on that? Yeah. What is that? Somebody do it. 25 divided by 60. 5 What? No, but no. we need to have a Point decimal number. Four two. Point four two. Is that what you got? Okay. 
Are we all right? Yeah. Okay. And then the difference here, 40 from 60 is how much? Negative 20. Negative 20 squared divided by 60. Hmm, that's sounding significant. <laughs> that's going to be a big number, yeah? Yeah. That's okay. Six. So then I would say, no, this it's statistically significant. It's significant. A significant difference is how you can think of it from what I expected. A significant difference from what I expected. This number is so big, when I pull that up on the chi-square value, that it is going to tell me that I have such a big difference from what I expected, there must be something coming into play. So age and gender, or I could say at least age, is a factor in how fast the cheetah runs. Okay? Observe minus expected squared over expected, add them up and see then if there if it's in the if it, the number is so big it would happen five percent of the time or less, then that's probably not due to chance. There's something up in this case with um, how old the cheetah is. Yeah. So how would you calculate the degrees of freedom? Okay, so in this case, I well, I just picked male as the expected, mm -hmm. but I had two, so my degrees of freedom would be one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I gave you three things, my degree of freedom would be two. two. Yeah. And in this case, go ahead. But how is it two if it's male? Well, female, if I included two. his, I could do him as the expected, and we could put him in there too. Uh -huh. I have no problem with that. Either way, you're still going to become up st statistically. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, totally. Okay, so we know how to do chi square for sure. We know how to do additional objectives. We know our cycles. You could diagram the cycles and label them. Yes. Okay. Here's some other. I'm just going to throw in some other for sure knows. Make sure you know the difference. Okay, between um, an exponential and what do you think I'm going to say? Logistic. And a what? Logical. Logistic growth curve. Do you remember the difference between those? G okay, what does exponential look like? J. A J. A J shaped curve, right? And what does a logistic look like? S. S. And it levels off at the what? Big. Carrying capacity. Okay, so let's let's break this down. What could you tell me about size of these animals? Small, Small and what? Large. Large. What else could you tell me? Differences. Long lifespans or lifespans. Okay, so we could talk about lifespan. So for the exponential, we would say it's what? Short. Short. And over here, you would expect long, right? How about number of offspring? You would say here, many, and you would say here, few. Now, this gives me a good time to introduce another curve to you that I want you to know. What's the other curve we talked about? The type of survivorship. Survivorship. Boy, this is messy. I apologize. It's been a really long day. Okay? Remember, they all start at like a thousand offspring and one goes like this, one goes like this, and one goes like this. Do you remember those three survivorship curves? Yeah. yeah. What's this one on top? Type one. Type, type one. one and this one is? Type two. Type, type two and this one is? Type three. Type three. Okay. So what kind of survivorship curve would we expect for an exponential growth curve? Type three. Type three. And it could go three to two technically and this one could go what? Yeah, primarily one, and it could also go to two as well. Okay, so we know the difference between survivorship curves, exponential curves, and logistic curves. We got that down? Okay. Can I move on? You okay? Are you stressed out? Any questions? We're good. Okay. So now, could you tell me the difference between um, abiotic and biotic factors? Could you, do you know the difference between those two? What is it? Yeah. Okay, so biotic is living, and this is what? Non-living, okay. Could you tell me, when I'm regulating my population, density dependent versus density independent, okay? Now, could you tell me the difference between density dependent and density independent factors? 
What's a density independent factor? <laughs> okay, right, but no, actually give me one. Weather. Weather. Okay. What else is a density independent one? What? Natural disasters. Natural disasters. Floods, right? Those kind of things. Tornadoes. Okay, what's a density dependent factor? Competition. What is it? Competition. Competition. Disease. What else? Disease. Disease. What else do we say? Density dependent. Habitat loss. You mean parasites, right? Right? Disease and parasites. Now, let's talk about this. Which one of these tend to be abiotic and which ones tend to be biotic? Density dependent tends to be biotic, and density independent tends to be what? Abiotic. Okay? Questions on that? Okay. So, now let me just do a quick skim to make sure I feel good about that. J shaped, S shaped, survivor. Oh, I know another one. Can you tell me about LDCs? And MDCs. What does that stand for? Less, Less developed developed country. Country. Perfect. Okay. So if you were going to do an age structure diagram, what would it look like for an LDC? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. What would it look like for an MDC? Good. Okay. And if we were going to break these into groups, we would have different groups. Do you remember what these groups are? Yes. Yeah. So we would say that this bottom one is what? Did you tell me? Pre, pre, and then you would say the next one up is what? Reproductive, and this one up here would be post-reproductive. Good. And what can you tell me about the LDC? If it has all of these in the pre-reproductive, they're probably going to what? Population's growing. And this, what about this population? Stable. Good. Give me a country. USA. Okay. Give me a country. China. Okay. Okay. That's all right. You gave me a continent. I'm good. Okay. It's like a continent. South Africa. Here, can I go back here for a minute? Give me the words opportunistic and equilibrium. Where would opportunistic go? Yeah, opportunistic, and this is exponential. Okay, perfect. All right. Now, this is super ugly, okay? I, I can also, even though it's super ugly and embarrassing, I can PDF it and put it in these if you want it. Does anybody want it? So ugly. Okay, good. You don't even want it. That's so pathetic. It's like, no, Miss Lynn, thank you, but no thanks. All right. Um, we did that. We did that. Um, oh, I know what I want you to tell me about. Tell me about the competitive exclusion principle. Competitive exclusion principle. What does that say? And you know what? You can't talk to me about it unless you could also differentiate habitat versus what? Niche. Looks like Nietzsche. Okay. What, what is a habitat? Where an organism lives, what's a niche? What, job. what, job. what it does, its job. Good. Okay. So if you have a particular environment, Called a is called the what habitat. Habitat. habitat, but they play different roles, right? In this niche, which brings me to another point. What would you call the grass and the trees? Producers. producers. Oh, I see another pyramid in my future. Okay, those are producers. What would you call this? Um, that's a giraffe. Whoa, <laughs> such a giraffe. What is it? What would you call it? A, a, consumer. a primary consumer. What else could you call him? Herbivore. Herbivore. Good. Anything else? Heterotroph. Heterotroph. 
We could also call this over here besides a producer. What else could we call it? Autotrope. Okay, perfect. Okay, this is a fox who is eating this bunny. Bunny is going to the fox. So what are we going to call the fox? A secondary consumer. What else could we call him? A carnivore. What else could we call him? Heterotroph. Okay, this is a fly who will eat the blood off of this giraffe and he will also eat from this flower. What would we call him? Omnivore. Right? Are we good on that? Another name for him would also be what? Secondary, Secondary consumer. What else would he be? Heterotroph. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now talk to me about the competitive exclusion principle. No two organisms can occupy the exact same niche for any length of time. One will die and the other one will live or they'll what it? Resource partitioning. They will share it. One will use it at the nighttime, the other one will use it during the daytime. One will be on the tops of the rocks, one will be on the bottoms of the rocks. That's resource partitioning. Yes, ma'am. Is that a no two species or no two, no two organisms? You can say both as long as you know the organisms are, it's, it's not like you and I, mm -hmm. okay, that's, we're the same species, it has to be different species. Okay. If it's just you and I, it's competition amongst ourselves, like okay. musical chairs. If you're playing musical chairs with your friends, right, you're just competing amongst yourself. If you're playing musical chairs with a polar bear, then you're talking okay. about the competitive exclusion principle. Oh, off the chair. Yes. Well, he's a secondary consumer if he's drinking blood. He's so a primary he's consumer if he's having the flower. So would you like specify that? No, I just say he's an omnivore. Yeah, I just say he's an omnivore. Now, knowing this, we talked about trophic levels, right? Mm -hmm. So who would we put at the bottom of our trophic level right here? The what? The grass, the trees in this example, right? Yeah. Who would we put at the next level? Yeah, the giraffe, right? And then who could we put at the next level? This fox, right? Now, did I draw that exactly right when I stacked those trophic levels? That's an ecological pyramid. Did I make it right? What's wrong with my model here of the ecological pyramid? Uh, there's no room for decomposers. No room. So decomposers aren't here. That's a question. What else? Did I draw it right? Yes. Uh, right. Usually only 10% gets passed on each time. Okay. Good, 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 good. Okay, we talked about that. Oh, okay, next thing I want you to talk to me about is there were two types of mimics. Do you remember the two types of mimics? Batesian and what? Malarian. Malarian. Bait versus malarian. Pat. Pat versus malarian. Okay, what is Batesian? Like, what, if you were gonna describe that for me, what would you say? Give me an example of a Batesian mimic, yes. Um, when something's not harmful and they try to look like something harmful. Yeah, so a fly tries to look like, like a bee what? or something. Like a bee, okay? What would be a malarian? When something is harmful and they're still trying to... Give me an example. A wasp and a bee? Fly tries look like bee. Okay, so this is a bee looking like a wasp, right? Yeah. Because they're both black and yellow. Black and yellow. No. They both have stingers. Okay, a fly is harmless and he tries to look like something harmful. Batesian. Think about it like he's trying to get him to take the bait. Like, really, I'm a spider, really, I have a stinger, take the bait, because I want to stay alive. Okay, this then brings me to sometimes organisms live with other organisms. Okay, how to do a month of class material in just one hour. So, what were the three types, remember symbiotic relationships? Yeah. What were the three types? Uh, parasitic. Parasitic. What's another one? Commensalism. Commensalism. Commensalism and what? 
Mutualism. Mutualism. Let's do math. What's parasitic? Plus minus. What's commensalism? Plus zero. And what's mutualism? Plus plus. Okay, and do you have examples for all of those? Give me a parasite. Yes, a tick on a dog. Exactly. Okay, um, give me commensalism. Yes, exactly. An epiphyte. What's an epiphyte? It's the one that it's the plants that grow on top of um, like the canopy in the forest. Um, let's see. Another epiphyte would be if something is attached to something. If a lamprey doesn't bother a whale, it can be attached to it. It doesn't cause it any harm, but it doesn't help it, but it doesn't hurt it. Okay. Um, and mutualism, what's an example of a mutualistic relationship we talked about? The clownfish. Clownfish and what? And the nem anemone. Perfect. A nem anemone. Okay, now, more things to differentiate. We talked about succession. There was primary and there was secondary succession. Secondary, primary. Which one had soil? Secondary. Secondary has what? Soil. soil. Okay. So soil would be like you have a farmer as a field and he just lets it go. Right? At first he's going to get weeds and then some other plants are going to eventually take it over. Um, primary would be you had a lava flow or the farmer decided to pave over his field with cement. So it's just solid cement instead of his land. <laughs> And so that's all that cement, right? You're gonna have to break that cement down until you get soil again. Okay, anything I've done so far scary? We all right? Yeah. Anything you want me to go over there more? Okay, then I'm gonna keep going. We have already done, now I'm moving on looking at chapter 34. We have already done producers and consumers. Yeah. We've done energy flow. Oh, do you know the difference? Here, let me go back here to this beautiful thing. What would be a chain? It's just straight up. Yeah, so you could go from these trees to the giraffe to the fox if he attacks him. That's a chain. What's a web? Multiple. So we have this going here, you know, this going here, whatever. If we have multiple food chains, that's a web. Okay, I think you got that. We did trophic levels. We did pyramids. We... Do you need me to go over the cycles, or are you kind of good with the cycles? We're good. All right. Now, let's go on to the last chapter. Wow. We are cranking through this. Um, behavior. Genetic versus learned. Okay? Now, what are some experiments we discussed that would support the genetic? It's in your genes. What ones did we discuss? Snake tongue flick. Snake tongue slug affiliation, right? And they took an intermediate snack. <laughs> snake. Okay, so they took they took um, snakes that like slugs, snakes that didn't like slugs. They bred them together, they got a hybrid, and they kind of liked slugs. And what they found out is when they flicked their tongue, they could taste. And the one that liked slugs had lots of flicks, so they knew the slug was there. The one that didn't like the slugs because they didn't taste it in the air. And it had an intermediate, so it was in their DNA. That was a genetic basis for inheritance, what kind of food they preferred. What was another genetic example we used? Yes? Lovebirds. Lovebirds. And and nesting materials, right? And how they carried it. So some cut long, some cut short, then they cut hybrid, and so they realized that behavior was genetic. What was another genetic one we talked about? What? Twins, good. And we talked about a plisia, that slug. Remember, and he would lay eggs if you gave him that right hormone. Okay, what was some examples of learned behavior? It was a big one, where it has to happen at a certain time, usually. What, tell me. Imprinting. Imprinting. 
What were our imprinting examples that we talked about? Yes. The baby ducks. Baby ducks following whoever follows, right? Lorenz, whoever shakes their head in front of them. What's another one we talked about? Salmon. What? Salmon. Salmon. Yep. And returning to their home stream. Um, remember the songs for the birds? And that's when they talked about how social behavior is probably a big part of that. If they had a tutor who was singing the song, then they could learn the song too. Okay, good. Um, next. Uh, am I going too fast? Are you okay? I'm just trying to get through everything. Good. good? Okay. So we talked about associative learning. Okay, and there were two big examples we talked about for associative learning. Classical, Classical and opera. Okay? Classical, what happens? Stimulus, and then you have a response, right? Whereas in opera, you have a behavior, and then it's either followed with a reward or a what? Punishment. And remember, this was with Skinner and rats, and this is with dogs, Pavlov. But just Pavlov. Just because there's a dog in it, does that mean it's gonna be Pavlovian? No. No, because if the reward comes after you, say roll over and I give you a treat, right? Yeah. Then that would be an example of operant conditioning. Okay, we also talked about insight learning. Do you remember that, where you do something novel and we talked about the crows picking the string up to get the food? Yeah. Okay. Um, 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 we did that, we did that, we did that. Imitation, imitation observation, where we talked about how they, the, um, you could watch your mom make spaghetti and you make spaghetti the same way. We remember we looked at the Japanese macaws, those monkeys, and they would wash the potato because their mom watched the sweet potato. Remember, it was really cool. The monkeys were by the water and they're like this. Remember that part? Yeah. Okay. Um, next, let's talk about sexual selection. Sexy. Did you see the song I was starting to sing? Yeah. Okay. That was funny. Okay, so we had female famale choice. Okay. Female choice. There are two hypotheses about famale choice. What are they? Runaway. Runaway. Good jeans. Good jeans. And runaway, these are things that are pretty. Feathers. Some big trait. Good jeans may be stronger. Provider. One of those two hypotheses when the female is choosing. Okay. On males, there could be competition, okay, that usually is some sort of confrontation. You have pecking orders. When males compete with other males to get with a female, like to have a territory, that was called intrasexual. When males compete, male versus male, it might be in a battle, okay? When females are choosing the males, that's what? Inter Intersexual. Okay, good, good. Oh, what is it called when males and females look different from each other? Oh, like you see here, sexual, what is it? Dimorphism. All right, moving on. If an animal, if a monkey could talk and he says, I'm fit, okay, does that mean he can do a lot of pull-ups? No, what is fitness based on? Your ability to what? Pass on your genes, okay? So then that brings me to the idea of altruism. Does altruism actually exist, do you think? No, you're saying I'm completely sacrificing for no reason. Okay, you are doing it. There is no added fitness for you if you're being truly altruistic. No added fitness for you if you're being truly altruistic. 
What we actually see it falls into is usually there's direct selection. I'm either eating a bunch of food because it's good for me, or I'm giving that food to my offspring. That's direct selection. What if I'm giving it to my cousin? What is it called? If I'm giving some of my barbecue to my cousin, what's that called? Kin selection. What if I'm giving some of my food to my neighbor because I know next time he barbecues, he's going to give me some of his barbecue. What's that called? Reciprocal altruism. It's not really being altruistic because I'm expecting payback. Okay? It's direct selection if I take care of myself or my offspring. It's kin selection if I take care of my relatives. It's reciprocal altruism if it's all scratch your back if you scratch, you scratch mine. Remember, what was the really good example we saw for reciprocal altruism? The bat. The bat. Okay, and believe it or not, we're down to our last thing, communication. What were the different types of communication? Yes, visual. <laughs> Give me another one. Auditory. Give me another one. Tactile. Give me another one. Chemical. Okay. Example and day, night are both. And I want to know is it fast or slow? Lord, that's disaster. Visual, day, night, or both? Uh, day. Yeah, usually day. Fast or slow? Fast. Fast, because I'm looking at it. Audit uh, example of visual? Oh, uh, you know. A dance. The, a dance. A dance. Sure. dance. Do a dance. Okay, auditory. Day, night, both. 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 So day and night. Fast or slow? Fast. Super fast. Fast, fast you're listening to it. Give an example of auditory. A yell or a bark. <laughs> Barking, yelling. Good. Okay, chemical. Day, night, or both? Uh, both. both. Day and night, both. Fast or slow, slow. compared to the others? Slow. slow. Give me an example. Pheromones. Pheromones. The come hither chemical. Okay, tactile. Day, night, or both? Both day and night. And fast or slow? Fast. Fast, fast, but it's a small number, right? Because only those you can touch. <coughs> right? A yell, I can yell and the whole school could hear. I could punch somebody and only one person feels it. Not that I'd want to punch anybody. What was the classic example for tactile? Waggle dance. dance. Remember, shimmy, shimmy, turn around, shimmy, shimmy, turn around. And the shimmy, shimmy, however many shimmies you have, tells you how far. Away. far. And the angle of your shimmy, shimmy tells you the, this, the, the, the direction, direction in relationship okay. to the sun. Okay, we covered uh, everything. Do you have any questions? <laughs> um. Things you want to ask me? Do you feel like you you feel better? Glad you're here? No? Are you scared? Is there anything you want me to go over? How about questions on any of these things you didn't catch? Because I was like, Wah. We're good? Yes? Well, I feel like, I don't know, like all of the diagrams. I know that oh, like, okay. Let's do it. Okay. okay? Water. Okay? Um, here's some water. What do you call it when it goes up in the sky? Evaporation. Evaporation. What if it's coming from a plant? Transpiration. Transpiration. Okay. When it forms a cloud? Condensation. And when it comes back down? Precipitation. Good. What does man do? Um, pollute it. Pollute. Okay. I you would do something better, right, than what I did? Uh -huh. Okay. You want me? I can keep going if you want me to keep going. Yeah. Okay. What's our next cycle? Cost. Carbon. Okay. Carbon. Is that land or water? I was gonna do water, but I changed it into land. Okay. Okay.
when plants take CO2 and convert it into sugars, what's that called? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Okay. When an animal, okay, when it eats those sugars and it takes the sugars in, What gas will it give off? CO2? CO2. What's that process called? Cellular respiration. Okay, and decomposers also do the same thing. They do cellular respiration, yeah. right? So that's putting CO2 in the air. And then talk to me about, so the only thing that takes it out of the air is what? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. Well, no, no, no. Okay, <laughs> and then tell me about man. Uh, Burn we burn fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, more. right? And that puts even more CO2, CO2 in the air. Into the so hideous. I can't believe you're taking a picture of it. Okay, <laughs> now let's talk about the phosphorus <laughs> cycle. Okay, so weathering will bring phosphorus, right, into. Um, either out of the soil off the rocks weathering, you'll get what? Phosphate. phosphate. And then that will go into a plant, plant. And then that can go to a animal. animal. And when the animal dies, decomposers will make it go back as phosphates. What does man do? Uh, man. What does he do? More, 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 which can cause an algal bloom. which then can end up causing death of the lake, right? Because you have too many plants, the plants die, too many decomposers, no, they use oxygen. up all the oxygen, okay? Nitrogen cycle, okay? So nitrogen starts in the air. Who, what's this process called? Bacteria do it. Nitrofixation. Nitro Nitrogen fixation, okay? And it goes from N2 to ammonia. Then the process of nitrification. Nitrite. Yeah, you form nitrite. You don't need it's NO2 minus, and then it's nitrate. nitrate. I'm not expecting you all that. Okay, just nit nitrite, nitrate. Mm -hmm. Then another way to get nitrate is what? <laughs> Lightning. Atmospheric. Yeah, atmospheric fixation. That will also get you nitrate. Okay, this nitrate then goes to who? Plants. Plants. That goes to animals. animals. And then mm, the plants and animals die, and it goes back into ammonia. ammonia. Okay, what does man do? Uh, oh, like, what does man do? Uh, you know, the, uh, the what's it? Fertilizer. fertilizer. Yes, and so they can increase <laughs> the amount of nitrates. They can put nitrix. Um, nitric oxides and cause pollution. Acid rain. Yay. Which kills the plants and the animals. It kills the lake. Okay. <laughs> all right, we did all four. Yay! Okay, good job. Don't stay up too late. If it's 11.30, you should be going to bed right now. Do you hear me? Or get a little snack and stay for 15 more minutes, but then you need to go to bed. Miss Litton loves you.